Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total protonic reversal. Protonic reversal. Protonic reversal. With your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock. About music, rock and roll, and cover power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with sharp and nails. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's so- That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed. It is a science thing. It is a science place. It is a scientific fact that we are all up in your face. It is time for the one, the only protonic reversal. Welcome to it. Welcome to it. Welcome to it. Back on a somewhat regular schedule now, probably even through the holidays. So anybody that has been missing the constant onslaught of Protonic, there's a bunch more coming. This is one of them. Been waiting to do this for a while and waiting? No, I've been wanting to do this for a while. Heather Smith, Bone and Bell. Bone and Bell's a very interesting uh, band slash artist from uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, Chicago is from before that, but really great record uh, to a cinder. Came out this year. I like it a lot. And I've been meaning to have her on for forever. And if quarantine is good for one thing, <laughs> I'm getting around to all kinds of stuff. So if you're not familiar, she's awesome. Uh, you need to check it out. A uh, very thoughtful uh, artist, musician. She works in augmented reality as well. A great visual artist as well. But uh, yeah, that's, that's going to be coming up. Uh, just quick thanks to everyone uh, for sharing the shows around. Uh, the nice feedback on, on recent episodes. It's always nice to hear. It's always nice to know the folks are listening out there. I uh, just really appreciate it. That's it. That, that, no, nothing else. ProtonicReversal.com for the archives. Uh, there's been significant catch-up, so the advanced feed isn't as advanced as it used to be, but that's okay. That's Don't don't worry. There's a lot. To, for folks, folks that uh, subscribe to the Patreon for the advanced stuff, there's a lot of coming, so uh, stay tuned for any of that. Uh, anyway, Heather Smith, Bone Bell. So okay, let, yeah, let's let's uh, let's dive into it. Heather, thanks so much for for joining. This this is a I'm, it's great to talk to you. I've been meaning to do this for a very long time, so I really appreciate you making the time to uh, do the show. Uh, you have an awesome, 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 awesome new record, and it's awesome just on the face of it, meaning that the songs themselves are good and it's it's uh, excellent. Listen, but there's a lot of kind of backstory to the path to it and and how you got there and it's you know somewhat documented in the record if you know uh, how to listen to it or you know that that's there but it's not a prerequisite would you mind telling us a little bit to how you how you got to making this one so it's been about um it's been about six years since I released an album and part of the reason for that was that I got hurt about five years ago which you know people in the PRF and like our friends all know but basically The tragic thing is that I was like carrying a box of like my own vinyl records. um, (laughs) (laughs) It's it's so like ironic, but anyway, so I'm taking my, my records from the garage to the basement because I'm worried about like warping and like the heat and all that sort of stuff. And we have like an old janky house that's from like 1925. And we have this staircase that leads to the basement. That's like, um curved and it's got like triangular steps on it and so I'm like rushing because it's too heavy for me and so I'm not I can't actually see my feet and I miss the step and when you miss the step you miss like three steps yeah so rather than like just tossing this like 50 pound box of records like away like I should have I actually like cradled it towards me and um and then it ended up, <laughs> like like a baby yeah no you know it's all like slow-mo in my brain of course but um, of course yeah in the movie it would be as well yeah totally so uh anyway the box the corner of the box basically pins my wrist to the concrete stair 
and it ends up fracturing it and dislocating it at the same time. And they, um, unfortunately they missed it in the x-rays for about five months and they couldn't figure out why I couldn't rotate my wrist. I was basically just stuck yeah. in like the palm up position, which um, I don't know if probably very few people have had that experience, but like learning to like chop things like this is like, actually yeah, yeah. So you, you, upside down. Yeah. Yeah. So your, your one, your one hand is, is, is stuck almost as if you're like presenting a platter. Exactly. Or I'm just like here, hors d'oeuvres, anyone? Yeah. Anyone? <laughs> yeah. Constantly. <laughs> Um, yeah because because it, it's it's almost as if you just don't have use of that hand at all for for some yeah activities, yeah right? it's like you don't, you aren't able to rotate it 1.75 hand you know like or 1.25 hands something like that but um but that's anyway, it if you have if you have a dinner party and you need to serve some hors d'oeuvres you're sorted yeah i mean i was a waitress for a few years so um i've already got i've already got some experience in that but um yeah anyway i got an mri eventually because no one could figure out why i couldn't rotate it and the doctor came out like in the middle of it and was like have you not had an x-ray and I was like yeah of course I've had like three x-rays yeah I was like well it's broken and dislocated so that's what's going on so I was like okay good good to know uh what do we do now because it's already healed uh you know in the locked position yeah yeah so, it, it, it's, it's it's already yeah <laughs> horses has left the barn at this point yeah for sure so um the first doctor that I talked to was actually kind of an asshole. Apparently surgeons are kind of like notorious, like uh, egotists, um, mm. sort of God complex people. And I don't know, I don't know if this guy actually had that going on because I only met with him like one time, but the, the reviews of him sort of indicate that. But anyway, he told me that like right then and there that I needed surgery and that I needed to choose to either be palm up or palm down for the rest of my life, probably. So I needed to choose an instrument like either piano or guitar. And I was like, and this was all news to me because he's like the first one I talked to. And so I, uh, I was like, OK. And then I went out to the car in the parking garage and just like cried my eyes out and was like, well, I'm going to get a second opinion. And I ended up getting like seven <laughs> seconds. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's a huge decision, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't, yeah. You don't just be like, well, that's the game, guys. I mean, yeah, that's... exactly. Well, okay, I guess I have to choose. Um, yeah. And because I was, you know, I was going to, if I had to choose, I was going to choose down because that's just a much more functional, you know, position, right? right like that's right. how you do everything in the world. And I work in computers and I kind of need to type like regular. So um, anyway, uh, Long story short, I got surgery, um, and uh, after I found a more optimistic daughter, not daughter, doctor, he's not my daughter, um, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm not sure where that came from, um, and I didn't really get my rotation back, and they couldn't figure that out either, and so I started doing PT, and I they got me a brace, which looks like this, like, ancient torture device basically it's like it's a full arm thing with like these metal pieces that connected to my body so I had to wear that all the time while I worked while I slept everything we're basically manually rotating my wrist as do as well as doing PT and um long story short like I we got to a point where they were like okay you got about 50 percent rotation and like that's the best we can do without just replacing your wrist with like a robot wrist so, and you're too young for that because that, that stuff, you know, wears out like over time. Yeah. 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 So you'd bas like you basically, if, if you, if that route was explored, that'd be something that, you know, in 15 years or whatever, you would have to have it redone basically. Hey, here's another totally. painful and expensive surgery while we swap in a new robot part for you. Exactly. So uh, anyway, after I heard that from enough people, I basically just decided to, um, to roll with it. And like, I had enough rotation. I'd learned to play again. Um, I had to play things differently. Uh, Cause I you basically had to relearn how to do what you normally did. Right. Yeah. And do it in a new way, basically. Do, do it in I, a different way. Right. Exactly. Right. With the new I, limitations. Don't, I don't have the rotation. I don't have the strength that I used to, you know, like there's just some weird stuff. So I just learned to fret things differently and play piano differently. Um, cause I used to do a lot of like sort of stuff, you know, bass, bass lines where I alternated between like the pinky and the thumb, you know, like rock mm -hmm. and back, stuff like that. Um, anyway, just had to change up how I did things, but I, uh, honestly, it turned out to be a really good thing. Um, I think it actually makes my work even more unique just by kind of like leaning into the constraint of it. I've found things that people wouldn't find otherwise, you know? Well, totally. So I, I'm th and I'm thinking of, uh, you know, uh, Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath 
his uh, pinky finger, you know, sure. like, I, it, it got like chopped off at like the, the place he worked. I can't remember yeah. the exact rationale behind it because of that, the way that he plays is, is kind of unique and idiosyncratic and often imitated, but it, it never is quite exactly the same because people right. don't have that, that same uh, disability. Django um, Reinhardt, you know, I mean, Django there's, Reinhardt. No, there's, another there's great example. examples of, of people who have, have um, just made, you know, made their music because they didn't have any other choice. And anyway, I think constraints and creativity are a really good thing. So uh, well, and it's it, it does show through because uh, even from you know being familiar with the earlier albums uh, and, and this one, it, it like it may be sort of ineffable, but there there is a there is a difference compositionally and, and just the the way things fit together, and, and I think it's something that if if maybe you know somebody's more astute with uh, you know music theory or whatever than myself could point out, they they get a. They can outline, well, actually, Conan is, burr, 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 burr. but <laughs> what I can just say from perspective as, as a, you know, just a fan and a listener is that it, it, it does, it does hit a little differently and kind of gets to maybe similar places you would have before, but in a kind of a different way. Sure. Yeah. I mean, my, my aesthetic, like the, my ear is still there. I've always played by ear um, yeah. anyway. And so um yeah, I mean, I think also it's just like, you know, it's been six years, so I've kind of evolved as a person, too. So. Well, well, exactly. And how much that do you attribute to this or how much you attribute to just wanting to explore different things yeah. the, in the music, the, the writing process being different for you because you're trying different stuff? Well, for one thing, I mean, this album was very cathartic for me. Um, a lot of the songs were kind of written, um, you know, in a very tender spot. And I think that that kind of emotionality comes through, which most of my stuff is is kind of from from that location anyway, or a lot of it. Um, so I guess that's not surprising. But um, yeah, it was it was a really healing album for me to do. It was also the first one that I I engineered mostly um, and and mixed and produced and stuff for the mostly it's for big the move. Show. It's a big move, yeah. and also it's a big move to do that with your own stuff because you're already so close to it. Yeah, that, totally. You know, that was actually really nice though, because I, although, you know, my, um, my husband, uh, Jason has been my engineer and mixer, uh, for the most part, like on the rest of my work. So we already have a pretty tight, you know, he kind of knows what I'm going for, for the most part, but there's, there've also been things that I wanted to try like experimental stuff, um, more gritty textures, uh, that sort of stuff that, um, that I just wanted to, to play around with. Like, I kind of think of composition, like creating the compositions of songs, like I do um, my visual artwork, like they're mm. really similar, like composition to me in both mediums is like basically the same thing. You're creating these like arcs of tension and release and, you know, these like, like storytelling arcs. And so anyway, it was fun to kind of come at the production part of it, like a painter, um, thinking about like, like, like the texture and um, all that sort of stuff, which I have done in previous albums, but I just had more control this time. So it was fun. It's like being a painter, if you also are constructing the easel and the <laughs> and every other piece of it as well, right? Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, the whole ship. But um, So, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, I, I, go ahead. No, that was it. That's That's basically how that album came to be. So when you're, when you're talking about, you know, approaching that and doing like every piece of that yourself. Do you have, do you feel like you have to set constraints for yourself to like goals and, and things like that to, to accomplish it? Because it, it's sort of like something that I found is that it's the mental discipline that's required to work on your own stuff is different than when you're in a, a larger collaborative exercise or something mm -hmm. that has deadlines that are, that are, you know, you're, you're being a jerk if you don't get it to somebody by a certain time or something along those lines so how did you how did you keep yourself honest through this knowing also that you were you know in some cases I, I you know going through PT going through physical therapy mm -hmm. life is happening mm -hmm. the world is the world <laughs> yeah I mean to be honest I've I've made enough things at this point that I have already kind of dealt with the monster of like overly refining something or like knowing when to like draw the finish line to say this is done this is done enough like there is no perfect so um don't overwork it like I feel like I've already learned a lot of those lessons hopefully <laughs> like fingers crossed 
Um, and so it wasn't that hard for me to um, walk away at a certain point. Like I, the way that I make typically is I'll, I'll, I'll write a song, I'll, I'll record it, I'll start layering things, but I have to step away from it like periodically so that I can hear with fresh ears. And at a certain point after I've been working on a song, I can just say, you know, like, I think this captures the thing that I was looking for. So uh, let's just go ahead and call it because, you know, there's there's no point in sitting on something until it's like like a perfectly polished turd. It'll like lose all <laughs> the life out of it. You know, like, <laughs> like look at my beautiful turd. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's ineffable and perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and it's it's there's a lot of sayings that that kind of gel with that, but you know the one that kind of comes to mind is, you know, no our project is ever truly completed, just abandoned. Yeah. You know, once once the music leaves your head, it's already compromised, et cetera, et cetera. There's plenty of aphorisms uh, sure. <laughs> to, to to back that of just the the wanting to know when something is done <laughs> and have that have that process for yourself to know when something is completed or, or at, at bare minimum that additional work to it will not improve. It will only <clears throat> postpone. I think it's kind of a trust thing, like a trust in the process, a trust in yourself and your own intuition to be able to tell when something is done and also kind of just trusting the work because it has its own life outside of you once once it's been made and, and sort of put into the world, you kind of just have to be like, okay, little baby, I've cared for you, you know, for so long. <laughs> now take this sailboat, you know, into the horizon and have interactions with all these other people. Um, yeah. And you're just not there to, to do that. So you've already done your part. Well, and, and so your music kind of first came to my attention right about when you did organ fantasies. And that's it's, it's something that was immediately noticeable to me was that, you know, the, there's a lot of there's a lot of space uh, in the music, but it's like deliberate space. It's something where like that's that's as much a, a, a part of the composition as anything else. And so it's almost to me, it almost seems like it would be just as important to know when it's time to take something out or or, or oh, not yeah. fill that space. Oh yes, yeah. I all of my music for the most part is pretty um, minimal. I guess is a way to put it, but like. Ever, I'm a big fan of like just putting in like like the absolute necessary essence so that what's there can have breathing room and and I think it's actually you know again it's I, I feel like some of that might come from my visual art background where like negative space is like a huge portion of the composition right but, but also just for the um, for the storytelling stuff uh, and for the being able to perform it in such a way that like um, I have time to feel the things or I don't know, like breathing room um, to, to perform it well. So anyway, all those things sort of combine to create like a very, um, not stark, but um, uh, minimal sort of thing. Right. And it's the wrong word, honestly, because a lot of the stuff that in organ fantasies, I wouldn't necessarily define as like minimal. But... No, it's not, it's not minimal so much as, one well, spacious is even the wrong word. <clears throat> just deliberate yeah. in its in its usage of of what happens what happens where, and that's you know you you like to think that's something that is, is more common, but it's definitely if you're someone that like listens for those kinds of things and 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 hears for it, it it's it's definitely apparent that that's a almost like a compositional tool. Yeah. Uh, in that way, I mean, don't get me wrong. I like maximalism too, but it's not oh, even yeah, that it's. Me too. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but it's something where, uh, and what I'm what I'm going at with all this, is when you're approaching something where space is so important, there's almost uh, the necessity that the things that are there do exactly what they're needed to do at that moment at time, mm -hmm. and when you're in a position of, you're kind of relearning how to do all of the things did you ever find that to be a challenge as far as getting the desired goal of what you had in your head versus what was on the on the record to be honest no uh because my process for this whole thing was one of allowing where i would and discovery where i would go a place and then sort of see where i was and then make a decision based on that and then move forward 
versus like having something in my head that I was trying to articulate and then and then creating it with my body. It was more like I was allowing my body to kind of lead the way. Um, and uh, I kind of find that that like, I mean, sometimes I write the other way, like I hear something and I'll, I'll create it. But like a lot of the time, it's just it's discovery and just like listening, seeing what happens. Did you have uh, any any arc or like mood in, in mind for it? And specifically, I say that because it's almost it's not like it's explicitly a a, a concept record necessarily, but it, mm. there there's again if you're if you're willing to look, you you can find you can find cer- certain repeated themes within there. Sure. Um, to be honest, that wasn't, that wasn't something I set out for. That was just that manifested from the work itself. And when I put it together, it was sort of like, oh, okay. You know, like, I'm sure this probably happens for you too. Like you make something and then you don't even fully understand it until you step away from it for a second. You're like, oh shit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I see what my like subconscious was doing there. (laughs) Like, great. Um, You know, no, other other things have like you know more sort of explicit themes from the beginning like organ fantasies but like uh, yeah. But yeah with this album it wasn't um again it was it was sort of discovery versus like pre-planning i wish i could give credit to who said it but i heard somebody say the album telling you what it is and mm-hmm. i thought that was a good good way to put it yeah uh, so there's you know th- there's a lot of interesting stuff with the, within the songs I, I was wondering if we could uh, just go through yeah. Uh, song, song by song on it. You could just kind of tell me a little bit about, you know, uh, lyrical themes, anything with recording and arrangement, uh, et cetera, sure. on everything onto a cinder. So we'll just, we'll just, <laughs> like, like any good story, we'll start from the beginning. So My Little Anchor is the first song. Yeah. So My Little Anchor, like when I wrote that, um, I knew that it had the potential to be kind of like, like a big poppy, um anthem sort of thing that had like a huge crescendo and I was thinking about like Phil Spector and but sort of in my own own way and so I was trying to create that um that vibe like the girl group sort of vibe for that particular song um and uh the I feel like the the addition of the horns was like really instrumental in creating sort of like the overall vibe of that song which was all Jason he wrote those and um, and created them. And, uh, but yeah, I, I, I like to start songs. I mean, um, a lot of my songs have a lot of dynamic range in them. That's one of the things that I try to do. So, uh, sometimes like I have a few songs on this album that start really small and spare and then just get, they, they, they kind of bloom almost. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's that, it's that storytelling arc, uh, both like, you know, in the audio as well as like the lyrical content and that sort of stuff. But, yeah, I mean, that song is just sort of about like um, the challenges of like a long term relationship, like like um, being in love with a human being that is like imperfect and, um, you know, and still loving them and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the Phil Spector thing, because it, it, the first thought that occurred to me is it's a song that <laughs> you, you could almost teleport back to like you know, the, the early sixties or something and, and, and have like one of those groups do, and it wouldn't, it, you know, obviously it would be different, but it would still, it would still work and it wouldn't seem like it was time travel or music <laughs> in oh, that way. I, I love, I love retro stuff. I mean, I think there's like probably a unconscious sort of retro vibe to, to a lot of the stuff that I do, but that's just because that's what I've listened to like since I was little. So it's just sort of found its way into to what I do. When did you first discover the Omnichord? too that's an interesting instrument I bought that for myself a few birthdays ago um and uh it was actually in response to the the wrist arm stuff too because I knew that I could I could kind of play that um one-handed ish you know uh and I just love the sound of it I love um auto harps I love that that sort of just like chimey like all of just the big swell of um almost drone that can happen with those sometimes and uh yeah so so I found one on eBay like a few years ago and uh it's really fun to play ours unfortunately has like like 
something going on where there's this like high pitch frequency that like plays all of the time that's like really <laughs> loud <laughs> so I have to like you know I got to use it in just the right way and and sometimes use some like you know like take out some frequency or whatever like like in the recording but um yeah it's a it's a lovely lush um kind of uh you know slightly synthetic analog sound it's kind of hard to describe but well yeah and they're very unique it's uh you know you'd be you'd be uh understood if you when you're looking at it you would be like oh that's a cool toy yeah you know, it, it just it just doesn't have it doesn't have a look that looks like it's built to last necessarily mm -hmm. but they're you know these bizarre instruments that are really very interesting and, and in its i think in the, the designer's desire to try to create something that was an analog to something they made something truly unique and and to this day i'm surprised somebody hasn't kind of latched on to that and like done like a modern version you know that musicians could actually uh, utilize that you didn't have to to baby because i know that there are i know a few other musicians who who do use them uh, jeff byron from the meishi and uh turbo lightning and whatnot he's he's a huge fan it has more of them than anyone i've ever seen but it's also it's kind of a weird thing that yeah you got to like go on ebay you got to go to a thrift store or something to find them and even mm -hmm. then there's no guarantee they've been well maintained can't take it anywhere to get fixed necessarily mm -hmm. so it's, it's this interesting yeah. kind of instrument from that that early 80s age of hey let's everything should be digital and electronic. Yeah, let's make something cool. And then, you know, some of those ideas were continued on and some of them were not. And Omnicore is almost like a dead end in that yeah. way. But it's such a cool sound. It's so unique. But if you know it, you'd be like, oh, I know what that is. And if you yeah, don't, yeah. you're like, that's a weird synth. What is that? Right. Yeah, they're they're very interesting. I mean, I have a thing for weird instruments. I like, um, I don't necessarily want like, like, I don't have an idealized like version of a guitar or anything that I want. I or piano even like I kind of I like the discovery of like finding like a weird vintage you know organ in an alley I mean that's what like organ fantasies was all about like we kept rescuing yeah, these yeah. like organs from from the Chicago <laughs> alleys <laughs> I was gonna say it sounds it sounds like uh sounds like a theme you should make a record on oh wait <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry yeah um yeah I just I like the personality of um of the imperfect and um yeah, I almost feel like there's like individual like songs like waiting to be discovered inside of uh, instruments um, that if you just play them long enough, like like something will kind of emerge from them. Like, I don't know. I, I don't really believe that because I'm not like super woo woo or anything, but um, but it does feel that way a little bit when just like give me enough time on an instrument and I'll discover kind of like a song that that, you know, was kind of waiting to be found. But. I don't know. Right. Yeah, and that's you know that that isn't woo woo necessarily as, as you say isn't necessarily the, the the thing. It's it's more just knowing that uh, you know just like that you have creative prompts, things that drive creativity for you. Right. Sometimes, it, yeah. yeah, exactly. The instrument itself could be a creative prompt in that way. Right. Uh, so down and below is the second song. Can you right. say um, a little about that? Yeah, down and below was kind of about. Um, it's about the reoccurring theme of, of depression and anxiety in my life. Uh, and just kind of like, you know, recognizing, uh, recognizing the cyclical nature of it um, and kind of like coming to terms with that. Um, uh, Cause I mean, I don't know. I think that I'm, I'm pretty good. I mean, honestly, like I've, I've been a little roller coaster in my life, but like my entire family deals with like depression and anxiety. And so it's just always kind of been something that's been around and I've had to learn how to have really good, like mental hygiene <laughs> in order yeah. to kind of avoid, um, you know, plunging too far. Um, so anyway, that's what that song was about. Um, and the picking pattern was just something I'd been playing with for a really long time. Um, and uh, yeah, just kind of about some of my time in Chicago and um, like a big, a big depressive dip that I had when, when I was like 26 that happened again when I was 36 after, um, after I got hurt. Seems to happen in like 10 year cycles or something. Psych cyclical. Yeah. Watch out when you're 46, I guess. I know. I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little worried. A few years, but. Well, um, yeah. And it, and it's, it, it, I definitely, you know, picked up on, on themes for that you know, like being location based, like tied to location and time, but 
yeah, it, it's interesting to kind of see. I don't know if it's a trend so much as just I become aware of it, but to see people kind of bringing some of this stuff out into the light to kind of talk about a little yeah. more explicitly, I, I think that's like that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm choosing to do it. Um, I think I kind of felt embarrassed about it for a really long time, but I found that if I talked about it with people, like I actually wasn't met with ridicule. I was often met with like more closeness and compassion yeah. from people. And so it was actually like, by showing, you know, this quote unquote weakness that I had, I was actually creating like, like bonds with people. And also, you know, like, like airing it out, like making it like less taboo to like, say that you've like had like mental, mental health problems so that, so that we can finally deal with them and stop pretending like they don't exist and we're all fine all the time. <laughs> right. Exa exactly. There's no honor or glory to trying to pretend that things are fine when they're not you know and, and it's the the fact that it's so stigmatized in our culture speaks more to our culture than anything else but it's it is interesting to see you know everything's a little smaller when it's out so it's it can be a yeah. divide unifying thing in that way yeah i grew up with my aunt helen um was developmentally disabled and um no one ever actually got her um no one ever, ever actually took her to a doctor to confirm exactly what was going on with her. She was kind of just treated as like, I mean, I grew up in the South and stuff. And so we kind of, there's a culture of like, like hiding your, your familial secrets. Um, right. And I feel like Helen was almost treated like that way in, in some, in some sense. And I, so I think from a young age, I sort of realized like how, um, uh, how impactful that can be and how negative that can be uh, for all of us to to just pretend that we're all alike and we're all okay. It's like it's like middle class pretense or something, which I grew up working class. So I, I think I haven't adopted a lot of that anyway. But, um, but yeah. But it's it, almost like taking on an additional burden you don't need to take on uh, sure. in, in a certain way, right? I mean, but it, other than the fact that like there's this implicit cultural thing that says oh I don't don't go talking about that you know don't 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 flaunt that that's not for anyone else to know it's like right. oh okay it doesn't doesn't mean it's not there though it's still right. there yeah I'm not interested in like pretending to be fine all the time um but yeah luckily I mean I think people people I feel like there's a, a sea change you know in regard to that sort of stuff so hopefully within the next 10 years we'll see We'll see more support and um, yeah, and less stigmatization. But anyway, um, let's see. What the only hammer I have is the next one. Okay, thanks. I was like, what some sort of again? Um, yeah, the only hammer I have is kind of a. That's one uh, starts with the. Uh, it starts with those uh, beach sounds and. Um... Yeah, that's um, that's actually taken from a 1940s movie set, um, like a that I found. Oh wow. On, yeah, on freesound.org, there's a lot of like free sort of like field sounds and that sort of stuff, which I like, I like to incorporate sometimes. Um, and yeah, think about non-traditional uh, sounds as like musical sounds. And so anyway, that song in particular, for whatever reason, I just always felt like it was beachy. There was something about like the little lick that, I, that I'd written that felt like kind of like lime and a coconutty, but like not that. There was something about it that was like touching on that. Um, I, I like this stuff and like um, uh, some kind of islandy themes. And, and so anyway, I think some of that was kind of seeping through. But, um, but yeah, I mean, lyrically that one, uh, <laughs> you would never know it unless you really pay attention to the lyrics, but it's about um, suicidal ideation. <laughs> It's such yeah. a happy song, though. Which yeah, is... yeah, but it, the tone of it is is not uh, depressing sounding. But I mean, I think yeah. there's there's there, there's certainly clues within within there. There's that um, you know, uh, if there's something going on out there, I don't care. Like there's mm -hmm. sort of like you know, it's it it sets the mood in a certain way. That if you're if you're if you're listening for it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I kind of like to do stuff like that sometimes, where like you know, there's this juxtaposition between sort of the tone of something and like the content. And so it creates this sort of like tension, which I think can be really good. But um, it was kind of about like, so luckily, like amazingly, I've actually never really like had suicidal tendencies. I've had lots of friends that have like, like family members and all sorts of stuff. But I have had, and I think most people have probably had this like, 
where you're in a situation where you're like, you know, oh, I could step you know, I could take two steps this way and I would be off of this cliff. Just this sort of like recognizing yeah. like how close we are to our own mortality and sort of the fragility of like like the human body and that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, I was just thinking about like, sometimes when I'm in a car, like I'll be like, oh, you know, I could just go like this. <laughs> just go you know, to the oncoming lane. Yeah, that's just... it. <laughs> yeah. So, it's a quarter turn to the left. <laughs> it's that simple. Everything changes, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Um, Anyway, it was kind of about that. And, um, but yeah, the song itself, like, I just really like the, um, that kind of retro -y island vibe coupled with some um, pretty like uh, antagonistic like synth lines that kind of are like yeah. peppered throughout, which is kind of fun. It creates that, again, like a tension uh, sort of thing. And then, um, of course, like string swells and, and, um, uh, and lots of, you know, layering. I mean, a lot of my, my songs sort of are dependent on these sort of like vocal layers that I, I kind of weave together. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's that song. It was pretty fun. Um, uh, yeah, and the dichotomy definitely, definitely works. Because again, it depends on if, if you're not a, you know, somebody, somebody referred to as a lyrics person. Mm -hmm. Which I'm like, what is the lyrics person? What does that mean? But the, I, I guess they mean some people only are like really paying attention to the musicality, the music elements of it, and not so much the lyrics on their own. Then maybe you you wouldn't notice or would only, hey, sure. wait a second, is that, <laughs> you know, kind of like notice it like far later or something along those lines. Uh, well, snake skin teeth is the next one. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. That, that oh, was more no, of an observation. No. Sorry. I just had a little story like a, a attached to that, which was I got hired to do. Um, this uh, to be part of this like group that was uh, performing uh, in Chicago. And I, I was playing one of my songs called uh, Flying, Falling, Crawling, which was about like this like series of nightmares I had about like serial killers and stuff. But anyway, but it's a very beautiful, like pretty song. And this was kind of a buttoned up like affair a little bit. And so I performed like three or four times like in these big like, um, you know, huge theaters and that sort of stuff for this kind of like buttoned up group. And suddenly like one of the producers of the group actually listened to the lyrical content of the song and was like, <laughs> was like whoa, like, uh, wow, that's um, that's a lot darker than I thought, I thought yeah, it was. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I mean, that's what y'all hired me to do. So um, anyway. Uh, Buy the ticket, take the ride. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, Snakeskin Teeth, um, was is kind of a fun gritty one i was playing a lot with like distortion and stuff on this record i feel like my voice is so tonally it's almost like a sine wave like it's very it can be very very clear like no vibrato mm -hmm. like very like just tone yeah um, sometimes and i think that adding a little bit of distortion or a little bit of texture to it can be really helpful to create um uh well just to create texture and to create sort of like uh, again, a juxtaposition or a contrast to uh, to the sort of like smoothness of of my voice sometimes. So, anyway, um, yeah, that song is is just kind of a weirdo, um, <laughs> honestly. Like, uh, I I think that I'm not even really sure what it's about, to be honest. I think I think it's about the lessons that I was going through. Um, like learning how to play again and just learning how to like live my life on top of this like these huge stressors that I was going through and the fact that like these lessons although I could tell that they were making me um stronger and a better person and I was growing they just they stung you know like and just the growing pains of um of uh yeah going through through hardship so yeah that's kind of what that one's about um do you ever think about things in terms of like cinematic aspects of stuff? And the reason why I say that is like with a fully design, you know, sometimes changing the articulation of uh, spoken phrases by using like a filter or, or using some kind of effect on it. Like that's, that's something that's used to evoke mood. Sure. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, again, uh, to compare it to like, like, you know, visual art stuff, it's like, you got to pick your colors and your textures, and, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, sure. all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing for me. Um, Whiskey C, I guess, is the next, the next one on the album. This is kind of an older song that had been around for a long time, um, which is, 
I, I was noticing a lot of addiction, like, uh, amongst my friends. And I was thinking about self-medication. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, totally. And myself included, honestly, like, um, you know, there, there have been some periods where I've clearly been self-medicating. Um, but, but also I was thinking about how that's integrated into class structures and the ways that like different mm. classes sort of express themselves. And I was thinking about like how working class uh, folks and addiction go hand in hand because of this, the ways that the working class have been sort of um, pushed to the limits of their bodies, like made to sort of abuse their lives and their bodies like like through their work for this like higher up and in order to do that day after day there's sort of a culture of of intoxication has kind of erupted around that just to like be able to fucking do that every day right which starts off as the have a drink after work and then that turns into a few drinks and that turns into okay that's the evening and then back at it yeah and i just noticed these people um being really unhappy uh you know, uh, working for the man, like, like being put through these like stressful grinds and, and dealing with it through, through alcohol and how common that is. <laughs> Too common. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's, you know, again, that's real stuff. Yeah. That, that's, so, uh, that's very real. <laughs> but vibe wise, what I was trying to get with that one versus the other songs was I wanted it to sound more like a live band, like in a bar. I wanted Hence to the drums that. and yeah, yeah, that's, yeah mm-hmm. the more like full expression of that song. I wanted it to feel like you were in like a working class bar, like hearing a band kind of rip it up a little bit. I, um, I, which which it does get that vibe. I, I also got to say, as as being a lyrics guy. I love the phrase wobbling tower of meat, by the way. I think that that, 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 that caught my ear immediately. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I've definitely had that feeling before. Um, <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, th- I think anyone that uh, has, has, has dealt with a drink has probably had that at, at some point or another. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's relatable. Uh, mortal moment. Yeah, mortal moment. Um was about trying to um trying to be present trying to uh you know be be fully aware of this life and um and take all of its lessons and you know disregard fears and and all that sort of stuff it's almost like a little prayer for myself um like i don't actively pray i'm not religious or anything but um but I sometimes write myself little notes through song (laughs) things that like lessons that I wish I could like take to heart and so that's what that song is kind of about and I wanted to create like a um you know again I'm not religious but I wanted to create that kind of like church choir vibe of right that's why some of the organs and stuff I was gonna say hence the organ yeah. yeah 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 exactly and the layers of, 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 you know, choirs, um, kind of in the background as it like builds, um, and, uh, yeah, to create sort of, um, you know, uh, a, a moment that could reverberate in that particular sort of spiritual way, maybe. Um, is there anything that have you in your own life kind of, uh, led yourself to the I need to be more in the moment vibes just because you've noticed that you have not been yeah. in the past is it that's oh, my yeah. thing you've noticed oh yeah I remember well a few things I remember like when I was a kid basically noticing that I wasn't noticing like noticing <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't yeah yeah and so I like, taking taking a moment I was in the back seat of a car and I I really I took all of my attention and I paid attention to like every single aspect of everything that was happening to me. And I remember that moment, like, you know, uh, perfectly. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've had some things happen that made me sort of like disassociate, like physically, like I don't necessarily like feel part of my body sometimes. Mm. I was attacked mm. by a dog when I was like five, it was like a big deal. And I, there was a lot of healing involved and like, I had to live on my stomach for like a couple of months and, Anyway, all that sort of stuff. I think that like as a survival like tactic, I sort of learned how to like be outside of my body. Right? Yeah, be in your be in your mind and, and kind of right. yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so anyway, I've noticed that like peppered throughout my life. Um, 
but uh, so yeah, I've been a struggling meditator for for many years now, and it does it does really help. Um, I'm much more consistent <laughs> now than than I was for several years, but um, yeah, I uh, struggling meditator is a is is the second great phrase for a song title. <laughs> the other one was uh, optimistic daughter that came up in the first of this. <laughs> oh, nice. They're both great. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Uh, Presence is a big deal. It's something I'm like constantly striving for. Um, I don't know. Do you meditate? Do you do you relate to any of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I so I used to be able to and kind of explored it a little bit when I was much younger, like in my very early 20s. And then for whatever reason, I find it extraordinarily difficult now. Like it's, it's very hard for me. I've got a, a, un, an unquiet mind. Yeah, monkey mind. It, it, and in that way. And so because of that, I just I find it very, very difficult. And I guess I should keep trying, but uh it, it's been it's been hard for me. I think I've I think my, my brain is is constantly wired to go seven thousand directions at once. And mm -hmm. even though that's on a multi track way, the whole point of meditation is to sort of quiet yourself down. Mm -hmm. And that I think that used to be easier for me for whatever reason. Yeah, it's hard. The The struggle is real. Um, and like I've quit uh, for for years before because I felt like I could never do it right. And then the. Um, uh, but is there is there really a doing it right with meditation? No, there's yeah. not. <laughs> that's, that's the false belief. Yeah. No, whatever you're doing is like totally perfect. And it's uh, it's not like we're so like goal oriented, like in our like in our culture and there's not like there's not an end point of meditation like you're not trying to like, yeah get, there's actually no enlightenment enlightenment in my you know in my book but uh so it's all about the journey and yeah there's no doing it right but when COVID hit like a bunch of other stuff happened I got like some some great opportunities like artistically I got like an art residency and like but my at the same time, my mom got diagnosed with breast cancer and was like dealing with all this stuff and then COVID and the racial uprising and, yeah. the, you know, I live in Portland and like that was kind of crazy. And it's like, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The police conflicts. And um, so I just had to start meditating. I was like mandatory. I was just like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm freaking out. I got to like, I got to. There's so much going on. It, 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 it's literally just for your own sanity at that point. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. That and yoga, the two things I think have helped me get through the past like nine months. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully those, the, my consistency will continue in less tumultuous times. We'll see. Well, that's, that's the key, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, they, they say that those that advocate for it say that it's almost just as important when you don't feel like oppressed by the world necessarily. Yeah. Uh, you, you just got to keep it up as a habit because you're training your mind to like listen to itself and then also not to listen at the same time and it, mm -hmm. it's something where that's we put a focus on it like oh stuff's so crazy right now I need to need to be centered but it's like no the idea is if you're going to be centered you should be centered all the time and that needs to be a, a practice because it's like anything like singing or yeah playing an instrument or something if you don't practice it yeah. Guess what happens? <laughs> like lifting weights, you know, you can't yeah, like yeah, exactly. wait once and like be strong all of a sudden. Like it's a, it's a consistent, like over time sort of deal. So yeah. Like I have these 30 pound weights. Why do they seem heavy to me now? They didn't used to. It's like, well, you haven't been doing this. That's why yeah. if you yeah, did it exactly. every day, it'd be fine. Yep. Uh, having nothing to do with weightlifting. Let's talk about little pieces. Sure. Um, that was born out of uh, a lot of things. I mean, that song was kind of inspired by uh, when I perform it, people always think that it's like about me, which a lot of my songs really aren't like at all. They're, they're, they're fictions that are sort of like cobbled together of like, like a bunch of different things that I've seen. But in particular, that song's about sexism and the way that it can integrate itself into relationships and um, the women that I've seen that have sort of sacrificed themselves for, um, for horrible men. And it's about the, it's about the evolution of the like, um, like, of here, you can you can do anything you want with me, like, like, I want you, I adore you, like, 
like I hate you I can't get to get away from you like um like please don't leave me <laughs> like that kind of weird like yeah. arc that can happen like in dysfunctional relationships um and uh yeah I've seen a few of those unfortunately um thankfully not not personally but um but I've had friends go through that stuff so why do you think there is that cultural bias to assume that a song with material like that would be autobiographical? Well, for one, when I perform, it's pretty emotional. I think that's one of the things I can do is like carry people into that emotional moment. And I think there's like an assumption that it's personal um, because, because I'm clearly like feeling it. Yeah. Um, but I have, you know, um, but that's, that's just that, not, but that's, true. that's empathy. Too. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah. I'm just I'm like a deeply sensitive, empathetic person, and um, and I was also a theater kid, so I'm I'm used to performing in that particular way, you know, like dialing into whatever, whatever the emotion is, and I mean it's real. I'm you know I'm not like like pretending to feel a certain way, but but yeah, it's just not it's not about me. But I've had a lot of people like be like are you okay or or right. well that was interesting you know like I yeah, know, yeah, I yeah 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 <laughs> well and and you know the vibe wise with the song like it almost fits in that grand tradition you know i guess con- it's most associated with country right mm-hmm. you, you know yeah, um, totally. <laughs> but there, there's as, as you know when you're when you're dealing with like uh, relatable concepts like that i think you know more people than are likely to admit can find some some truth, if not for themselves and for someone close to them or someone they know, yeah. you know, a, a parent or somebody along those lines. Who knows? But it's something where it, it's it's always been weird to me that it, it does seem like the guy sings a song like that. It isn't immediately assumed it's about that guy's lived experience. Mm. But when a woman sings a song like that, for some reason, there's always that assumption. I, I never think that. But the, I, I also come from a very, like, I, I love allegory, mm-hmm. right? So that, that's where I'm coming from. But I've never understood that. I've never, if, if, I mean, I just assume it's cultural sexism of some kind. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, is it? Well, you know, there's like the, the falsehoods that like women are more emotional than men. There's yeah. like, you know, women don't lie. Like, you know, they're these like pristine little vessels of, of whatever. Um, <laughs> but also, but I do, just to give you a counterpoint, I do have male friends who um, who have been accused of like, of like uh, having autobiographical songs that are like, like I have one friend, Adam Fawcett, who's like a great singer songwriter and he has one song about sort of an abusive relationship and he's had people like come up, come up to him after performances and be like, man, I'm gonna kick your butt, you know, like, why are you women? <laughs> like that whole thing. And, um, but it, he does sort of strip down stuff too. So I wonder if it's like, maybe that like partly, like, I, I find it hard to believe that like, like a loud, like super loud, like rock band or something like that, the, the, the lead singer would be, you know, sort of targeted for like writing autobiographically. Maybe I don't know. Like, yeah, but th- but then people just aren't paying attention to the lyrics. So right, it's hard to hear. You know, like <laughs> it's much more about the vibe than about like, like the yeah. lyrical storytelling content. But um, yeah. Anyway, I don't know. Yeah, so I don't know. That, that's rampant. it's in everything. It sucks. But. Y- yeah, you know, it's. It, it, I think being aware of it helps in some case but i, I don't ha- i don't have a specific answer for that other than, other than cut it out you know but. well yeah i mean we all have to like look at how we learned all that stuff it's not like this stuff happened in a vacuum or that it was born out of people being bad it was out of seeing seeing the oppression act out and then replicating it because we're like little kids and we're like trying on the things that we see right. um you know it's uh societal it, it is and it's it's not something we're probably going to sort out during the course of this episode unfortunately but probably it, not yeah <laughs> we can move on <laughs> uh reason for the beast is next yeah so i was when we moved to portland um our first place was this like little apartment um very cute like 1960s kind of apartment and we had a friend in town and we were we were just hanging out about you know 11 maybe midnight, something like that in the living room. And I suddenly heard this like loud pop sound, like, and we were all like, what was that? 
And it sounded like a dresser being like knocked over or something, which is like a weird thing to compare it to, but um, that's what it sounded like. And then uh, I went to the back uh, window of our kitchen, was like washing something. And I watched all of these like police officers just like running through an alley. And I'm like, what's going on? This is really weird. But I was hanging out with a friend, you know, whatever. So we went to bed. And then the next morning I woke up to discover that one of our neighbors in a, in a drug rage had, had basically shot his wife and then walked out of our courtyard and had walked around our courtyard telling everyone that he loved them. And then, and then he went upstairs and shot himself. So I guess, <laughs> I, I think I heard the first, the first gunshot. Um, and the woman who was shot, his partner was also named Heather. She was like one year older than me. Like, um, I don't know, it just really, it really shook me. Um, and thinking about um, domestic violence, like when we moved from Chicago, I mean, in Chicago, we were around a lot of violence. We, you know, we, we lived next to parts of town that had like gang violence and all sorts of stuff. But when we moved to Portland, I was noticing an increase in domestic violence. Um, and I don't know if it's just because there was less of the other violence to like talk about or like what the shift was, but I just kept hearing every single day was like a new story about a woman being beaten or murdered by her partner. And, and so it just hit me really hard and writing this song was like part, part of my processing, um, like trying to figure out like how, you know, how people are brought to the point of, of murdering other people, like this gun violence that we, we keep seeing manifest in our country, like where the fuck does that come from? Like, how does a person find themselves able to shoot their lover? You know, like, yeah. and the fact well, that all of us have like maybe a little seed of like monster waiting inside of us, like that can be expressed depending on, you know, depending on drugs, depending on like what happens in our life, like stressors, like emotional breakdowns, all sorts of stuff. So. It's just sort of reckoning with um, the darkness, you know, that we all have, like a little bit. Um, yeah, and that, and that's a uh, you know, there's the, the line that gets me in that too is that there's blood in his eyes and a sense of deep relief. Yeah. To and I've I've given a lot of thought on that because when you think about you know motivation, you think about you know why people do what they do, which that all those you know what investigates and discovery or whatever the murder, murder, murder shows. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, they've, they've commodified that and turned it into like an easily digestible trope but you know people don't arrive to that place from nothing they you know there, there's motivation behind all of it and i mean i think i was trying to empathize with him too a little bit you know like or not right I mean, not empathize but like i guess yeah attempting to empathize like try to figure out how how he ended up there um which, you know, it's really easy to like dehumanize people who act in monstrous ways, but right. they're still human beings. Um, well, that comes back to the the theater thing, right? Like, you know, the, the villains rarely consider themselves the villains. They're just, you know, sure. th they're the misunderstood heroes of their own story. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, with that song, like the vibe I wanted to, I recorded an initial demo version of that just in my bedroom, like the day after it happened. And there was like a quality to it that was like so fragile and so like caught in the middle of the night or something. Um, and I wanted to preserve that quality, which honestly, I don't know if, I don't know if I nailed it like on the album. Um, I think I, I think I did get part of the vibe there, but, um, but I just wanted to, I wanted to create a sense of like, intimacy and and like dealing with something really complex um like one-on-one -on -one with a person or something that was right the effect i was trying to go for but um yeah heavy heavy stuff heavy uh, stuff heavy, heavy stuff, stuff. <clears throat> i mean the next one's not not lighter uh old friend old friend yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a heavy record i mean like it's it it, there's nothing it, wrong it with really that is. it's just it's a heavy yeah. record you know I mean, honestly, I think I was just trying to heal and, and like art and music are like cathartic for me. And so uh, some of that came out, but um, yeah, I mean, God, uh, old friend <clears throat> is uh, just about the fact that um, I know pretty much every woman I know has like a story of like sexual assault or abuse or something of some yeah. sort, you know, Same. of various yeah. levels and <clears throat> how 
how tragic that is and how often it's it's uh, those offenses are um, from people that we know and trust. And it's again, it's, a, it's sort of like the insidious nature that's kind of lurking around the corner, like in all of us or, or in someone close to us. Um, and so anyway, it's a, it's again about that, that kind of darkness. Um, and yeah. And so I tried to create, it's sort of, it's got this water theme to it, um, which I think there's something about drowning that, it, <laughs> or, or being underwater or something that's like, you're like carried a, a, a by these like waves that like you can't even really see underwater and there's something about that 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 ran parallel to um to to some of these other themes that I'm talking about so anyway I incorporated like sounds of like water and um dripping and dirt like yeah pretty dirt water <laughs> it's it's a uh, make you earthy a isn't dirt. the right word but it's got yeah, yeah it's got the it's elemental in that way. <laughs> so, you feel elemental. a little grimy, like listening to it was was kind of one of the, I don't know, slight motivations. But um, the next one was Can't. Uh, which which is actually my favorite one on the entire record. Oh, thank you. I love that I, one. I like it too, uh, to be honest. It's really fun to play. Um, and that was born out of a, a, so a combination of things, but it's kind of about, it's about like, going from being sort of like, uh, I don't know, being vulnerable and sort of blaming your problems like on the world, like to like uh, a disempowerment all the way to empowerment, which is like the end of the song where it like gets big and bold and is like, no, you can't, you know? Um, yeah, turn it around, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so it's, uh, I tried to capture that in the dynamics of the song. So it just starts out really spare and um, and gritty a little bit and then builds up to this like big crunchy, fuzzy uh, wall of wall of sound sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it's got this gradual build that kind of goes, you know, at, at from a more uh, low, key, low key might be the wrong word, but from, from a more intimate place over to this, this big, uh, kind of more beastly presentation yeah as it goes i just wanted it to be like cacophonous and um yeah and and pull someone along for the ride with that so um yeah it's a it's a fun song and i hope it's uh i hope it's the right song for certain people in certain times i, I hope it's the sort of song that you can like blast in your car when you really need it and just fucking totally yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it, it can it like in its in its way in the telling of the story in and of itself could be you know motivational to to, to have that turn around i tried to keep the the language really simple and and generic in a way that like generically specific an, uh, open enough that other people could identify with it really clearly and kind of use it like try it on or wear it um in whatever way is appropriate it's them so like like it could fit other situations that weren't maybe yes. necessarily the ones in, in mind when uh, writing it right like it's an empowerment hat that i could like hand to people and be like you wear you know if you need to like feel right. this way <laughs> wear this and yes yeah, scream your guts out or whatever so um yeah and then after that La big, big loud one, the last one is Counting Pennies. Um, which, which is the last song on the record. Yeah. And, and did you, I guess we'll, we'll start with that one also, just why was that one the closer? Like, why did you say that's, that's the one that should be at the very end? You know, picking an order is hard, as you well know. Um, picking, <laughs> picking an order for an album is really challenging. Um, but I, after the big crescendo of Cant, I wanted, I wanted to return to something that was like, um, uh, a little bit more like spare and intimate and also that was a little different than all the other album or all the other songs on the album so um, it's the only one that is only piano driven there's a little bit of electric guitar that's been run through various processes to create sort of this like choral effect that happens in the background but um, uh, but it's it's pretty stripped down it's just my voice and a piano and uh everything sounds a million miles away. Um, that was actually one of the first songs that I wrote on piano. So it's actually a really <laughs> old song um, that I've been meaning to put on an album for forever. And 
I performed it with bands and it's like a totally different song with bands. It's much more um, girl group sort of thing. Uh, and, or zombie prom is what we, we end up zombie calling prom. <laughs> like, it sounds kind of like a zombie prom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I get it. That, that's evocative. I like it. Yeah. Uh, but this this version of the song for this album was kind of just a new way of doing it that was just very stripped back and... Um, yeah and themes wise it's you know it's sort of about it's again sort of about like long-term relationships I feel like a lot I don't write about like love a lot I feel like that ground is like well worn for good reason (laughs) yeah adequately covered by yeah you know an artist or two yeah (laughs) love is love is lovely um yeah it's great and I'm all for it (laughs) it's all of most of the songs that were about that like that early love right like the love of infatuation and desire and like I just met you and oh my god my heart's beating out of my chest that sort of stuff but like fewer songs are about the like the like the old love the, the love that's been around the ringer like a few times and wasn't right. that, perfect and still yeah, that, was that, that's somehow less of a uh, uh topic that is, is it's not low-hanging fruit it's higher hanging fruit to, uh, well, it's to not, pull that it's from. not as shiny right yeah because it's, it's not idealized um but it's the real thing and if if you have any sort of long-term relationship you'll 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 see that like you have to come to terms with the fact that like you're not constantly desiring this person all of the time or agreeing with everything they say or right. you know are completely pleased with everything they do that's just like not life so um so yeah, it's kind of it's kind of about that and how um, I don't know, like how you can spend your whole time in a relationship feeling like you want out of it, but ultimately it's the thing that like um, made you whole and sort of like uh, you know was the most important thing, even if you couldn't recognize it in the moment. I feel like there's that sort of like hindsight uh, element that I'm kind of touching on, but yeah, but. You know, I sort of wanted to start and end the album with those two themes of this like long-term complicated love. Um, that that was sort of a mistake, but when I saw it, I was like, okay, that makes sense. Um, and uh, yeah, and vibe-wise, I just wanted it to feel there. I got like a, a new pack of um, Arturia uh, plugins for pianos and synths and and all sorts of stuff, and I discovered this like gray. American uh, piano that just sounds like it's just full of ghosts. I just feel like if you like lift it up, you know, like the top of the piano, <laughs> the like cartoon ghost ghosts would fly out. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> like, like Casper, just, Casper yeah. style or something. Either yeah. that or it's, yeah, it was just recorded like like on a foggy hill or something. Like there's just something really atmospheric about it that I liked. So um, yeah, so I took that vibe and then ran with it. And then Jason came up with the uh, the sort of choral guitar thingy that's on there that kind of sounds like my background vocals. We actually originally had background vocals on there as well. And I felt like they they were competing. I needed, again, about the minimalism or, or just making sure that the elements that are there are all like have a specific purpose. Um, I just felt like that was too much. So we edited those out and just kept the, uh, the uh, guitar. And it, it kind of did the same role. And I think is like a little, yeah, a little different. So anyway, that's the album. So that's to a cinder, and I don't think I mentioned earlier, but uh, boneandbell.bandcamp.com. Yeah, uh, for that, it's also on the other thing. It's also on the other stuff. I do want to talk. Uh, you know, we've we've alluded to it because that could be not, but the 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 visual art element. I, I love the. You know, as a for instance, you can get like the print with with the VR experience, which is very unique. That's not something the augmented reality world is not mm-hmm. something that a lot of, of bands are taking advantage of and you're in a unique position to do so uh, yeah. was that just a you, you know wh- wh- how did you approach that was that just something you had in mind the whole time was it because you also work with that art form and you just were like hey why don't I just do this for my own stuff as well as engineering it and writing it and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly I have that pattern. Uh, it's true. Yeah, yeah, uh, I noticed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, 
so I work in re mixed reality or I have for the last year. I tried to get into it about five years ago um, when I was working in like mobile games and that sort of stuff and interactive design, uh, which is what I what I've done for for the dollar bills for many years. <laughs> and right. um, anyway, got into mixed reality about a year ago and have just been really excited because it's it's the birth of a new medium. Nobody knows what it is yet, what it's good at, like what kind of storytelling it will be especially like good at doing. It's um, Wild West still, yeah. <laughs> it is, it's totally Wild West. And I like that. I, I kind of like being on the bleeding edge um, a little bit. Uh, it makes for a lot of like technical headaches. I mean, to be honest, like there's so many of those hurdles that I'm like constantly having to kind of overcome. But I'm just trying to remain flexible. And again, working with constraints can be a really good thing. So as long as I can like keep my attitude like good about that stuff, it, it makes it easier. But so I hadn't really planned on doing an AR uh, accompaniment to um, to the album, but I, uh, you know, I, I make visual art, you know, I'm an illustrator and I knew I was gonna illustrate the album cover um, which I did, which is like kind of a combination of a volcano and vocal cords. I've had other people say that it looks like um, a uterus, which I totally get. I, <laughs> get that way. I, I, like, I wasn't thinking it. about that, but I now that I'm looking at it, having you having heard that, I can yeah. see that. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that's basically what I what I I felt as well. But um, <laughs> I felt like there was, you know, as I was making that, I knew there was a little bit of a narrative there, like in 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 the, the illustrated piece. And I also knew that uh, in my other work, one of the things that I'm trying to kind of um, discover is like how music or how audio can be integrated into AR and VR, how you can actually like, like what would be like, what would a song in augmented reality be? And how can you, um, how can you create a piece that leaves enough space and, and modulation for the participant to actually make an impactful, um, you know, to make impact on the song, to actually change the song or the experience of the song right. like in, in an authentic way, like giving them agency and sort of allowing for, rather than having like, like a song that is just a monologue, like a one, one way, here is the song, your ears interpret it, you know, and do whatever you're gonna do on the inside, Rather than doing that, doing presenting with a bunch of options, and then the other person sort of responds to it, and it, it creates a dialogue. That's the whole idea. Yeah, how do you make it a how do you make it a choose your own adventure rather than a strict narrative arc? And Deeper than that, too, though, like not just like choosing from a list of like A, B, or C, but like like actually having greater agency. Effect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and there's no guidebook for that that I'm aware of. I mean, if if there no, is, I'm, I'm not aware. Yeah, of it, no, so. it, it's not. Um, as far as I know, it hasn't really been a made thing yet. And so I'm just kind of exploring that. And I wanted to explore that for this album, but the software that I that I was using to create the stuff was was not that advanced. <laughs> and so <laughs> it it morphed from like this big idea of like, oh, I'm gonna do an AR song that's gonna like like be fully adaptive and you know, like this huge like big idea to being like, well, I'm going to include a uh, a secret song like an extra song on the album on this like additional sort of path that you can only discover you know through this AR experience and then create like um some behind the scenes stuff and and so it sort of became the like the extras you know like the dvd extras of of, of the album and it comes with an art print that you can like frame because uh, art prints are what i do in my my regular life so well totally and, and that seems like that's something where you don't need to be someone who's experimenting around with augmented reality or honestly even know what augmented reality is to you know you can still appreciate the fact oh there's this awesome piece of art that comes with this that, yeah that that was the hope um which if you look at the larger construct of you know most people that buy vinyl uh you know the the the, the, the sort of open secret is that a lot of people still listen to it digitally but they have it as like the you know the, the physical keepsake so it's like what are they what does that mean if not by an art object yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what I love about about buying buying the vinyl or buying the extras for a band. I like I like finding out more about the process and I like I like getting something extra, you know, like if you're going to make the additional gesture of like purchasing this thing, I feel like that should be met, you know, by the artist uh, by providing something like special and 
Um, well, it's definitely special. It's, it's definitely interesting. I'm, I was uh, I was very happy to pick that up because it's, it's something where it's like, oh, this this is just on its own. Just having the print of that is like that's just a nice piece of art. But like also to to know that there's this other thing that maybe even I uh, understand but have not like fully immersed myself into. Uh, admittedly, like it's it's nice to have that uh, as an available as available thing, pretty much. Well, it's probably going to be like a weird artifact, like in a few years, right? It's going to be like like a, I'm, you know, it'll it's either going to be way above its time and be like, oh my god, one of the first whatever, or like, oh yeah, remember back when you know, like CD ROM, right. like the first iPod or something, <laughs> right? Yeah, know? yeah, yeah, exactly. Like yeah. I think back to like the Poster Children CDs that had like the oh, it's got games in it and stuff like that. There's all this other content that, ha- and and then now it's like hey there were these things called cds Mm -hmm. and (laughs) you within those you could have this other stuff that because you put it in your computer to -hmm. listen to and if you didn't put in your computer you wouldn't necessarily be but like the idea of that is is in the you know to be a cultural dead end because that format fell out of favor but you never know what's gonna what people are gonna latch on to i mean i still recall to this day like somebody talking about how streaming would never be effective or popular right right (laughs) like an impassioned and you know well-reasoned if even if i didn't agree rant sure about how like it wasn't possible and i was and and i was like well it's possible i'm telling you it's possible it's just it's not something we put a priority into if you need buy-in from the people making and distributing the stuff which obviously we have now and now it's well of course it is streaming everybody knows that but yeah there were some people that passionately argued against it so turning all the back around you know i could see augmented reality becoming something that catches on i could see it being something that's you know just a niche interest and i could see it just being a dead end but i'm really excited that you did it for this because just it's it's an extra thing that other than just an awesome record you kind of can get out of this which i think is really cool i was trying really hard to make it more than just a cherry like a sparkly like like novelty sort of thing like um and uh I'm, you know, I hope that that as the technology um, gets better and better, I'll be able to really lean into that. I don't feel like I quite achieved what I wanted to, to be honest, um, with the AR experience for this. But um, if, I mean, having been in the world for about a year, I will say that I think AR is probably going to land like in a more ubiquitous way, like within the next 10 years, like a big part of the hurdle is is hardware. Um, So, uh, there anyway i think within 10 years we're probably going to see some sort of device that allows us to experience ar more fluidly and not looking like a big dork like with google glasses or whatever um and <laughs> right like looking you're like you're in some like 80s sci-fi movie or something yeah and along, the apparatus. <laughs> yeah and with the internet of things and like the continued like digitization of our world like the the virtual world and and the real world are just going to blend more and more and more and then, and probably full scale adoption for VR will be a little bit later, actually. Everyone thought that VR was going to be like the big dog, like initially, and there was a whole lot of hype and a whole lot of money like thrown around in Silicon Valley and all sorts of stuff around Magic Leap and a bunch of other companies. Um, but uh, but uh, yeah, I think AR is actually going to be um, more ubiquitous earlier, but we'll see. It's early yeah, days. Think. It's super <laughs> early days. I like went to a convention at MIT like earlier this year before like COVID hit um, with some of like the top people in the industry and even those guys are like oh it's super early days and we don't we don't yeah nobody know knows gonna happen <laughs> nobody knows exactly so, yeah so I'm just I'm just hanging out out there on the frontier basically seeing what I can do well Heather really appreciate you spending all the time and, and, and talking to me about the record. I think it's a great record and people Thank should you. check it out. Again, it's to a sender, bonabell.bandcamp.com. It's also on, you know, Spotify and uh, sure. YouTube and like whatever, however you I listen to stuff. All the places. Yeah. yeah. Go to your friendster and download it. You know, what, any of that stuff. <laughs> friendster. Damn. Have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> MP3.com. Sure. Let's take it all the way back. Uh, so la- last thing, uh, before we go is I have just the one can question I ever ask people and that's just why do you do what you do? Oh man. Um, 
I have to. I mean, if I didn't, I think I'd be so sad. I think I'd be so sad all the time. Like, like actually an indicator for me, if I'm feeling like bad is I can actually be like, okay, have I made anything? And often I haven't. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> now I just have to go make something and I like feel better. Um, but yeah, I mean, I grew up in a household of, of musicians and artists, and it was just such an integrated part of life um, that I, I can't imagine not doing it. I mean, it's, it's what I spend all of my time doing. Other than loving people and like petting my dog, like and exercising every once in a while, like, like making stuff is, is what gets me up in the morning and um, gives me things to look forward to. And uh, yeah, it's just who I am. So can't can't extract it from me it's just the way it goes <laughs> awesome thanks yeah. so much Heather this this thanks has been a blast having me I appreciate it good to talk to you and, good to uh, talk to you as well yeah have a good weekend right. take care Bye. Uh, Bye. all right there she goes Heather Smith Bone and Bell let's listen to a Bone and Bell song right now this is Can't <laughs>
only air ham Ugh. only hammer I have and uh, can't before that. Is this thing on? Those are both songs off of the excellent record To Ascender by Bone and Bell with my guest for today. Heather Smith. Yeah. Find that uh, anywhere you get your music. Bandcamp is where I favor. <laughs> it's also on Spotify and all the other, other things. Uh, as are all the excellent Bone Bell records. Oregon Fantasies, which we didn't really talk about. Morning Broom, which we didn't talk about at all, but it, it's all there. Heather's awesome. That was great. You've been listening. To kind of neutrons, protonic reversal. Thank you so much for doing that. The show airs live. Radio Nope, usually Thursdays, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific. Podcasted later everywhere. Protonicreversal.com. Patreon.com slash Protonic Reversal if you're looking to hear an episode earlier. One dollar a month gets you early access. Otherwise, you just gotta wait. Mr. and Mrs. America, all ships at sea. Wanted to give a huge thanks to everyone for sharing episodes of the show around that they like. Uh, and say nice things that uh, that means a lot to me and it means a lot to the continued I've got health and vitality of the show so thank you 50, watts of reviews are kind of dumb but it helps people find it as well so if you feel so inclined to navigate the maze the an iTunes review or on your listening platform of choice helps people find it that's the only reason why I even talk about it I think it's dumb <laughs> this microphone turns sound into electricity. No, that's no sponsors. No kidding. Can you hear me now? Stay safe out there. Out on Route 128, in the dark and low. And take it easy. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the... It's the end of radio! The last announcer plays the last record! The last what? Leaves the transmitter! Circles the globe in search of a listener. 
if there's no one there to receive She like turned on, she unmuted a channel and it like made, we were out of the house at the time and it was just like blasting like a loud tone for like several hours and ended up like busting one of the, the speakers. But yeah. Oh no, oh, yeah. that's terrible. <laughs> they weren't that expensive. It was not that big of a deal, but uh, yeah. We, I don't we understand how, you know, there's like child, child locks and child controls for everything. Mm -hmm. Why aren't there like pet controls? Especially now that everyone's discovered the joys of, of working remotely. Yeah. <laughs> and like pets being involved in every part of that process. Why are there not, why aren't there, they're kind of like pet controls. Like they, they have like, the, so there used to be a, um, like a windows program specifically for cats that I forget what it was called, but what it would do is it would set up a message cat like typing detected and it would like automatically disable it. If it was like a bunch of keys mashed oh, down. Wow. Yeah. But, but it was like, I'm talking about like, this is like 15 years ago. Like where did right. that go? This, this person would be like, making money hand over fist just to have that one that one thing i think you i think you've nailed something conan if you want like you know like a plan like b or c for your career it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like uh pet proof people's work from home situations yeah. i mean conan's cat guards something like that. 